welcome to your last class in the Bible Seminar as we wrap up our study. It's been eight weeks and kind of 16 different parts to the uh, lectures that we've done, and we're finally at the last one. So we'll be looking at the genres of the Gospels, and then we'll look at the genre of the apocalyptic literature in the Bible. And so I hope you're excited to kind of see especially the apocalyptic literature, kind of the more difficult and deep and um, challenging genre uh, at the end of our lecture tonight. Uh, but then also excited to wrap it up and be have, have kind of come through the whole uh, lecture series and be able to kind of see all of the different tools that you've put together and then be able to use them moving forward. So as we get into our last lecture tonight, let's bow in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for just bringing us here safely and uh, helping us through the weather tonight. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us and for the gift of your word and how it reveals who you are and the plan of salvation that you've given us through your son, Jesus. And Lord, it's to your glory and honor that we're here tonight, and we pray that you would help fill our minds with a knowledge that would be helpful and knowing your word better, and being able to apply it to our lives. And so it's to that end that we pray that you'd be with us tonight, and that your spirit would work uh, through the um, activity of this lecture. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do in part one of our lecture tonight is talk about the Gospels. But before we jump in there, let's do a quick quiz talking about um, lecture from last uh, week. Uh, we looked at poetry and wisdom as two different genres last week. So two questions to go along with that as a quick review. First of all, when it comes to Hebrew poetry, what kind of things can we expect to find in the structure of Hebrew poetry? How is Hebrew poetry arranged as a structure? Or what, what would we expect, Wendy? Well, it's terse, it's concise, oftentimes. What else about it? Yeah, we see lots of parallelism in Hebrew poetry. That's probably the most identifying marker of Hebrew poetry itself. And then all sorts of different kinds of parallelism, which Gordon Fee talks about in the book. And so we're, we won't go over all of them, of course, but lots of different parallelism. What else? What kind of thing, features do we find in the structure of Hebrew poetry? A couple other things. Yep. So, so sometimes we'll find acrostics, and that's what we mean by that. Yeah, not always, of course. Um, it's a little bit more rare to find them, but they exist in Hebrew poetry from time to time, and they can be an interesting feature about poetry that you have to be aware of, because you will come across it occasionally. Acrostics. One more thing. Right. We see lots of figurative imagery in poetry, of course, and so that can be probably the biggest challenge of trying to understand it and interpret it and apply it is figuring out what the imagery means. And tonight when we get into apocalyptic literature, we're going to talk about imagery once again, but from the angle of how it relates to the apocalypse. Okay, question number two. What is the purpose of the wisdom literature that we find in the Bible? What is it supposed to do for us? Or help us do, anyway? That's ex exactly, yeah. Now, wisdom literature, um, even more than just speaking to the intellect, it speaks to our heart, it helps us look, listen, think, and reflect on what it means to live out godly character. And sometimes that thinking and meditating and reflecting really needs to be done patiently as we work through different wisdom literature like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, um, because sometimes there are questions to life that don't have a simple black and white answer. And so the, the wisdom literature can help us live in a godly lives despite different things in life that don't seem easy to answer or walk through. Okay, so then let's talk about the Gospels then as a point of um, biblical genre. So what are the Gospels? What, book of the, what books of the Bible are we talking about when we say the Gospels? Right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, from the New Testament. Um, these um, gospel books um, 
relate to the life of Jesus, of course, and they, they speak of the life of Jesus and his work in ministry, particularly the three years that he was um, in ministry and then crucified and resurrected. Now, the word gospel itself means good news, and so as it relates then to these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of the gospels tell us the good news of Jesus, what he's done for us in his ministry and his work while he was here on earth. And so this is the good news of, of Jesus. Now, if that's what the Gospels are, as we kind of see them in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, well, what is the purpose of these Gospels being written? I think that question, although it might seem simple on the surface, well, the books of the Bible were, or sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written to tell us about Jesus. That's the purpose. But really, the whole Bible is written to point us to the person of Jesus. So what is it uniquely about the Gospels that help us see the person of Jesus? And then thinking as well that, well, the Gospels were actually written as it relates to the New Testament a little bit later than some of the other letters and epistles. So a lot of Paul's stuff, James, um, that stuff was written even before the Gospels. And Mark may have been written a little bit early on, but the majority of the Gospels were written a little bit later on, um, after Jesus had um, ascended into heaven. And so why would the Gospels be written, and then particularly not right away? Well, what was the purpose of these Gospels? Yeah, good. Yeah, the, each one of the Gospels has a particular theme and purpose. Now, they all are trying to express the life of Jesus, of course, but they're taking slightly different angles. They're not contradicting each other, but the author had a different audience that they were writing to, and they had a slightly different reason for writing about the life of Jesus. So if we could state the purpose of the Gospels in a sentence, it might be this. Uh, the Gospels are meant, all of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to present Jesus as Lord and Savior who brings about the new covenant promise of God's kingdom on earth. So we know the new covenant was foretold by the prophets, particularly Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And so if this new covenant is going to come about, well, how exactly is it going to come about? How is God going to change the hearts of people and forgive them of sin, like Jeremiah expressed and Ezekiel expressed? Well, Jesus is the one. So the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're meant to show us that Jesus brings about this new covenant and brings about the promises of God's kingdom here on earth. So then, what about each gospel individually? Well, tonight we're not going to do a deep dive on each one individually, but I'll summarize each one of them, and in your notes I think that summary is there. Uh, Matthew is more specifically written for the purpose of being written to the Jewish audience, of course, as Caleb said, and for the point of trying to demonstrate that Jesus is the true Messiah King that they were looking for, and that this King is going to bring about the kingdom of God that they're hoping for. If God's going to bring about his kingdom on earth, who's going to be the king of that kingdom? Well, this Jesus. And so Matthew is going to demonstrate that, or that's part of his reason for writing. He's going to show Jesus as the one who brings about the promise of the new covenant, but from the angle of Jesus is our king, and he's the one who's the king of this new kingdom of God. The Gospel of Mark is written, um, it's the shortest of the Gospels, is likely written more to a Gentile audience, maybe even the, a Roman audience. And the purpose of Mark is to help show the works of Jesus, how great of a Messiah he is, and all the wonderful things he can do in his power and might. And so if he is the one to bring about the kingdom of God on earth, then Mark is saying, well, of course he is, because look at all he's able to do and his great works and power. The Gospel of Luke emphasizes that Jesus is our perfect representative. He traces the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam, reminding us theologically that Jesus is fully man. So when he dies for our sins, bringing in this new covenant, he's able to provide forgiveness of sins because he represents us, humanity. So Luke is saying, Jesus is bringing about the new covenant promise of God's kingdom, like all the other Gospels. But specifically, Luke is saying, 
Jesus can do this as our perfect representative. Son of Adam, or son of man. And then uh, John, as a gospel writer, is going to specifically zero in on the divinity of Jesus. And if you believe in this Jesus as Messiah, you can have eternal life. It's the main thrust of John's gospel. So, of course, they're all telling us that Jesus is Lord and Savior, bringing about the new covenant promise of God's kingdom. But each gospel writer will zero in in a slightly different angle and and, um, special purpose for why they're writing about Jesus himself. So what are some features of the Gospels? Or in other words, what do the Gospels look like? Or what are some traits that you could recognize as being kind of patterns in the Gospels? Well, first of all, you'll often come across these short narrative accounts in the Gospels. Now, remember way back when we were studying Old Testament narrative, narratives in the Old Testament were like books of the Bible like Joshua, Judges, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. These were longer books of the Bible devoted to talking about the history of Israel. Well, the Gospels also communicate historic information as well, but in a unique way, because the Gospel writers weren't super concerned with the arranging of events in chronological order, uh, nor were they interested in giving fine-tuned details. Now, sometimes they did, but the main emphasis, of course, was giving shorter narrative events for the purpose of explaining some kind of theological principle. And then also, they would be coupled with sermons and teachings of Jesus. So much of the Gospels, you'll find the recordings of Jesus Um, sermons and his and his teachings to his disciples and those sermons and teachings of course they were paired with the narrative events of Jesus life and I'm going to show you some examples of that as we as we kind of go on in the exercise later Um, but you'll find narrative accounts shorter than the Old Testament of course but historic events nonetheless you'll find sermons and teachings of Jesus all throughout the Gospels And then you'll find parables of Jesus as well. Now, parables are still teachings of Jesus, but the reason I kind of put them in a separate category is because parables are kind of special teachings that deserve a little bit extra attention because they're not quite as straightforward as a normal sermon or a typical teaching. Um, A parable of Jesus is kind of this, it's an ancient form of teaching where the parable itself is kind of testing the listener. The parable is trying to test the listener to see, do they really understand what Jesus is saying? So the parable calls the listener to respond. How are you going to respond to this particular story or proverbial statement from Jesus? Are you going to understand it and listen and follow him? Or is it going to fall on deaf ears? So parables reveal the nature of somebody's heart. Are they receptive to the message, or will they miss it? So oftentimes when Jesus would give a parable, the parable would land on the listener's ears, and they would either be offended, or they would be receptive and humble and accept Jesus. And if they were offended, like many of the religious leaders were, it's because they knew Jesus was pointing out some kind of fault in them. And instead of them listening, they just got all the more angry at Jesus. But then sometimes a listener would hear the parables of Jesus, and they would know, I need to change. This is about me. This is about us. And now God is welcoming us into his kingdom. So I need to be ready for that. So the parables, they kind of tested the hearer's heart. And they were special teachings um, that you'll find throughout the Gospels in different ways. And then, in the Gospels, another important feature, or I guess a list of features that I would say you're going to come across, are these special literary techniques. Literary techniques that you're probably not going to find anywhere else um, in the Bible, in the New Testament especially. And the reason I call these special literary techniques is because they're often found embedded in the teachings of Jesus. And since Jesus was teaching primarily to a Jewish audience, he was teaching in a Jewish way, 
in a way that's a bit foreign to us nowadays. So you'll see certain techniques of teaching like exaggeration or hyperbole, where Jesus will intentionally exaggerate to get your attention, to make a point. He's not literally trying to say that something was to the extent that he's saying it is. When he says something like, if you're going to follow him, you have to, if you're going to love Jesus, you have to hate your mother or your, your father or your wife or your children. He's not literally saying hate them. He's using hyperbole to get a point across about the love that we're meant to have for Christ. So he'll use exaggeration many, many times. There'll be the use of metaphors, irony, rhetorical questions crop up again and again in the teachings of Jesus. So when you see these kinds of teachings and techniques, they deserve patience and to, to think through them and to wonder, now why did Jesus say this this way? Um, okay, so these are some of the features you'll find in the gospel. Um, rules for interpreting the gospels. So this is what we'll end on before we get to the exercise. Um, rules for interpreting. And um, some of this is going to be probably familiar because it kind of relates to our previous rules to other genres. But first of all, especially rule number one, read and understand the individual story or teaching and notice how it's connected to the bigger theme of the book. So, understand how an individual story or teaching is connected to the bigger theme of the book. So you would ask the question like, okay, if Jesus is teaching this particular message, whatever it might be, you're maybe in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, and, you're, and Jesus says something like, judge not lest you be judged, um, or you are the salt and light of the world, or if somebody asks you to walk a mile with them, go an extra mile, or if they ask for your coat, give them your undergarment as well. Why would Jesus make these statements that seem to be so radical and intense? Well, what's the bigger picture of the book? Jesus is the king of a new kingdom. That's the book of Matthew. So his Sermon on the Mount is trying to teach us how to live as citizens of this new kingdom. We're going to look and act a lot different than other people of this world. And so that's what I mean by what and you have to understand how the individual story or teaching or try to think about, well, how would this relate to the bigger picture or the bigger theme of the, uh, of the gospel itself that you're studying? That's the first thing to think about. And secondly, uh, look for connections between stories or series of stories and teachings that are grouped together. Now, this doesn't always happen in the Bible. Sometimes there's maybe a singular narrative event that happens in and of itself. But what you're going to find in the Gospels is quite often you're going to see these groups of teachings together. Um, maybe groups of parables or groups of teachings on the kingdom of God or groups of rebuke that Jesus, when he's talking to the religious leaders, he says, woe to you Pharisees or woe to you leaders. Um, you're going to find groups of teachings and stories all over the place in the Gospels. So rule number two is look for the connections between those groups of stories um, within the Gospels, right? And again, we'll give you an example of how this works in just a little bit, right? Look for connection between um, groups of stories um, or teachings in series. Again, you're going to 
oftentimes find these groups all together. You might find parable after parable after parable, or you might find teaching, then a little story of, you know, about the life of Jesus, and another teaching right after it. And those series or that group together is kind of all communicating one big thing in maybe a couple of different ways. And so it's important to see how those series work together. Again, I'm going to hope to show you a good example of this in a few moments. But then lastly, another rule for interpreting the Gospels, identify how the specific teaching concerning Jesus describes Christian life in God's new covenant. So identify how the specific teaching uh, relates to life in the new covenant. Okay? And that's kind of going along with a lot of the other principles we've talked about in the genres. When you're studying a book of the Bible, you, you need to try to remember how is this teaching or lesson or book, how is it telling me or how is it informing me to live in God's kingdom, in God's new covenant? Uh, he's given me a new heart. He's given me a new life. And so this book of the Bible in some way is showing me how to live in light of that new covenant. So the Gospels especially, because they're about Jesus and they're about his kingdom coming, are going to show us how to live in that kingdom. Yeah, Terry. That's right, yeah. So these teachings would have been very important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some of these books would have been written right around that time. Um, you would have to kind of look into the history a bit. Probably Mark... And, um, and Luke, maybe, if I'm remembering right, where it had been written before the temple, uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem. And then John, almost certainly, John, uh, the Gospel of John was written afterwards. Um, and so y it's a good point, Terry. We've got to keep that in mind. What's going on in, um, in the context of the Jewish people, uh, the, the Christian people as well, as they're hearing these teachings? So yeah, kind of going back to the Sermon on the Mount, when the Roman... Soldier comes to you and says, carry my stuff for, for a mile. And Jesus says, go an extra mile with him. Well, the people would have viewed the Roman soldiers as enemies. And so doing something as kind and generous as that would have been completely radical and, and counterintuitive to the uh, Jewish person of his day. So yes, the, uh, the, um, the historical context is very important too for remembering what's going on in the life of the Jewish people and the Christian church. So those are some of those rules that might help us to be guidelines. They're not necessarily always going to be the be-all and end-all, but understanding how individual stories are connected to the bigger theme, seeing how some of these series of stories are connected together, and then seeing how um, they point to life in the new covenant. That's some rules for what we might, help, might be helped in interpreting these Gospels. So, with all of that in mind, let's take a look at an exercise from Mark. So if you have your Bibles, would you open, go ahead and open them up to Mark chapter 8. And what I'm going to do is just read Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. A bit of a shorter passage, but... Uh, would someone like to volunteer to read that for us tonight? Okay, Steph, go ahead. Okay, good, good. Okay, so let's work through the, um, the three steps of interpretation, context, theology, and application. And work through that passage together. So first of all, uh, context of Mark. And the bigger picture, um, what is Mark all about? And I just mentioned it briefly. 
Yeah, so the works of Jesus, what he's doing to demonstrate that he's the Son of God. Um, That's a quick, concise statement. We could maybe say a little bit more about the Gospel of Mark, but for time tonight, we'll we'll stick with this as kind of a quick summary. Uh, Works of Jesus, the big picture of what Mark's going to be trying to demonstrate. So it makes a lot of sense then as we read the particular healing of the blind man. Well, okay, Mark is once again demonstrating something Jesus is able to do in his healing here, healing this blind man. So the book is about the works of Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus is able to heal and bring sight as only the Son of God can. Okay, well, what is this individual story kind of saying about Jesus healing? What happens in the story if you had to kind of summarize it and and can maybe restate it in your own words. What's going on? Yes, Jesus heals a blind man, but what happens specifically? Right. Okay, so Jesus heals a blind man in stages, which is a little bit weird, right? Because Jesus, we believe, had the power to just outright heal the man. So he didn't have to do it in stages, but he does. So stage one, he, what, is, what did he do, Caleb? He said he spit, spit, um, and mud. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Spit on eyes, and um, the man sees shadows, trees, right? Okay. He took him outside the village to Let's circle back to that, closer to the end, because I think that relates to when he says, don't go back into the village. And we're going to maybe try to answer why that is. Good, good observation, though. Good. Okay. And sees, okay, so the way I wrote it was, spits on his eyes, lays hands on, and the man sees shadowy trees, the people moving, and then lays hands on a second time, and he sees fully. So in describing the healing of Jesus, which is one of the many works that Mark demonstrates in his gospel, this particular healing is a little bit different and strange, because again, he does it in two stages. Number one, He does this spit on the eyes. Number two, he lays hands on again. And the man sees in parts, and then he sees fully. Okay, well, that's interesting. And if all we had was that one little account here, and then he sends the man home saying, don't even enter the village. Okay, if all we had was that, we would probably be in a difficult spot trying to understand what is the point of that healing. There are lots of other healings Jesus does, and he just seems to do it immediately. In fact, we know that there are some examples of Jesus, people simply just touch him and they get healed. That's how powerful he was. So what happened here? Did Jesus lose power? Was he unable to heal completely? Was this man specifically like really, really blind? And it took like Jesus thought, maybe I just need this much power, but he really needed more power. Probably not the answers, right? Like, based on what you know about Jesus, he can raise from the dead. I mean, healing someone's blindness, probably less of a degree of difficulty. So why did it take numerous steps? Well, to understand that then, we have to look at these series of stories together. So in other words, we can't understand Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26 without looking at what's around it. So I want you to look at how the story is connected to the surrounding episodes. Go back to Mark chapter 8, verses 14 to 20. I don't, don't, for the sake of time, I don't have to read it all. What I'll do is I'll summarize it by saying, in Mark 8, 14 to 20, Jesus gives this little quip about the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't trust the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples, it says, they don't quite understand. Look at verse 17. 
And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive and understand? Are your hearts hard? Then verse 21, he says to them, Do you not understand? So Jesus gives them a teaching about the leaven of the Pharisees, saying even just a little bit of their teaching and influence is going to lead people astray. So don't trust any of it. And the disciples don't really understand what he's saying. They don't perceive it completely. And Jesus says, what's the matter? Don't you yet understand? Are your hearts hard? You don't understand the teaching. So that's the kind of the, the story that butts up against the healing of the blind man. That's the first story. And then we have the healing of this blind man. Um, and so, let's, so, so um, story one, um, leaven of the Pharisees. Um, and disciples don't understand. Story two, blind man healed in stages. Um, but fully sees eventually. Okay, story three. The story directly after the healing of the blind man. So Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. This is a shorter one, so let me read this one for you. It says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one. Okay, story number three. Peter, in a sense, speaking on behalf of the disciples, understands something very important about who Jesus is. Most of the people out there don't understand who Jesus is. He's John the Baptist. He's Elijah. He's a different prophet. Peter says, no, 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 no. The answer is, you're the Christ. And that's the right answer. So in this story, Peter, as one of the disciples, perceives and understands correctly, right? So Peter perceives and understands Correctly. Sorry if the spelling is a little messy and I'm kind of, I know I'm going fast. Peter perceives and understands correctly. So, when we put these three stories together, we start to see a pattern, a trend, an idea start to come out. Story number one the disciples don't understand one of the teachings of Jesus, and Jesus wonders, why don't you understand yet? Story number two. The blind man is healed, doesn't quite see, and then is kind of healed again or touched by Jesus again, and then he fully sees. Story number three, we revisit the disciples. Many of the people outside of the disciples' camp don't perceive and understand who Jesus is, but Peter finally gets it, and he knows exactly who Jesus is. He perceives and understands correctly Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So what is the author of Mark doing? In demonstrating the works of Jesus, he's showing us the progress of the disciples. The disciples then are being compared to this blind man. And Mark is kind of saying the blind man was an illustration for what the disciples went through in their spiritual understanding of Jesus. Just like the blind man, the disciples at one point don't see and understand Jesus at all. Then, they have some interaction with Jesus for some time, and they see a little bit. They're beginning to understand a bit, but not completely. Like the blind man. I see some things like a shadow, but not completely. 
And then the disciples come to fully understand Jesus as the Christ. Just like the blind man fully comes to see and perceive everything correctly. So this is kind of the context. And what I mean by trying to figure out how the stories work together to explain a a bigger picture of what's going on. So this is all having to do with the context of of Mark chapter 8, verses 22 uh, to 26. So then once we get that kind of context in mind, if you want to write anything else down, go ahead and do it because I'm going to erase it soon. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's good. That, and so Mark is, is doing all of that in showing the way Jesus works. And that's really important, the way Jesus works. Well, theology. What kind of theological point could Mark be making? We know this all about the context. Mark has been making these statements about the inability of the disciples to fully understand. And the blind man is this grand illustration for how they didn't see clearly, but now they do see clearly because they have this special interaction with Jesus. What kind of theology can we learn about um, this healing from the, of the blind man? Well, the healing of the blind man, I believe, is, is more than just about physical healing, of course. It's about spiritual blindness that was clouding the disciples' minds, and of course, many of the other people who are following Jesus as well. But in this story in particular, we see the disciples emphasize. So, um, so we see not just about um, physical Blindness, uh, but spiritual. So it's not just about physical, but about spiritual uh, blindness. The disciples started out not being able to understand exactly who Jesus is, but they come to see correctly just as the blind man comes to see correctly. So one or a couple of principles I would suggest are this. Jesus, first of all, brings spiritual understanding of himself to the disciples. Jesus does. Where once there was a veil over their eyes, they didn't see, they didn't perceive, they didn't understand, like anybody else in the world or any other of the Jewish people, the community, Jesus brings spiritual understanding of himself to his disciples, just like he brought physical sight to the blind man. Now, the blind man didn't choose to see, right? The blind man didn't make himself see when Jesus did. And so the same principle, I think, applies to the disciples as they are coming to perceive Jesus more and more and finally understand truthfully who he is. We could say Jesus brings... Jesus brings spiritual sight um, understanding of who he is. That's, I think, one theological principle. But then a second one would be this. Going back to what Danny said about, what about this village? He takes him outside the village and he tells him not to go back in. Well, the second aspect of this healing is that Jesus chose to reveal himself as Messiah to specific people in accordance with a specific timing. And by telling the blind man not to go back into the village, what he was doing was saying, I don't want other people to know about this yet. That's why you're not going back into the village. And then he kind of repeats that idea back down with the disciples after Peter confesses he's the Christ. It says in verse 30, he charges them not to tell anyone, right? And so that's why I think Jesus is implying to the blind man, don't go back into the village because I don't want people to yet know what's happened here. 
And you might ask, well, why? Why? And this is, a, this is a pattern that happens over and over again in Jesus' ministry. It happens not just in Mark. It happens in almost all of the Gospels where Jesus tells people, do not talk about the healing or the teaching or the special thing that you just saw. And the reason is because he has a specific timing that he wants to reveal himself as the Son of God. And so not only does Jesus choose and bring about spiritual sight of who he is to others, to the disciples, but he has a specific timing that he wants to do it in. And he's going to reveal himself specifically as the Son of God through the crucifixion and resurrection. And that time has not come yet. And so over and over again in the Gospels, he'll tell people, don't say anything yet. Not because he's simply trying to trick other people or deceive other people, but because he has a timing that he's following. He's following the timing and will of his Father. And so the second principle, it's a, kind of a more subtle one, but it's still there nonetheless. Jesus chooses to reveal himself in God's timing. Okay, so what we've done is we've tried to take this event of the healing of the blind man and apply some kind of theological truth, figure out what was the theology uh, that Mark was trying to convey. And I think these two points are helpful, and maybe you would have worded them slightly different, and that's okay. Jesus brings spiritual sight, who he is. Jesus chooses to reveal himself in God's timing. And then lastly, what we would do then in interpretation is apply some kind of application. Okay, so if this is the truth that Mark is telling us, a couple of points of application. Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me point out a couple of points of application, I think go along with that. What does it mean to have full sight and knowledge of Jesus? Peter gives us the answer, confessing Jesus as the Messiah. In other words, if we say some really interesting things about Jesus, or know some truths about God in the Bible, perceive maybe who he is, but we don't know Jesus as Savior, we're not seeing fully. We don't have the sight necessary to do what? To be part of the new covenant, the kingdom of God. So remember, the book of Mark is one of the Gospels. The Gospels are trying to show us how Jesus is the Savior, bringing about the promise of the new covenant, the kingdom of God. And Mark in particular is going to show us the works of Jesus, how Jesus is the one who can work to achieve through his power as Savior the bringing of this new covenant. And so if Jesus is the one who gives me spiritual sight, what I need most is for God through Christ to reveal Jesus as Messiah, Savior in my life. My spiritual sight is knowing Jesus as Savior. So, I would say, first of all, application in the form of what to believe. Not so much what to do, but what to believe, how to believe correctly. So, um, what I would say yeah, is um, full spiritual sight is knowing Jesus as Savior and Messiah. That's what the word Christ literally means as, as, as Peter confesses it, right? So that's what it means to have full spiritual. I know that's a simple truth, but it's one of the truths the Gospels are trying to reveal to us. And think about how important that is in a world that believes, in our day and age, in a culture that believes that all faiths lead to the same place, and that someone can kind of express spirituality so long as they believe in a God of some kind, uh, everything's going to work out for them. Not according to the Gospels. The Gospel of Mark is very specific in telling us, like other Gospels, 
what it means to have real spiritual sight, to be part of God's covenant family, is to know Jesus as Savior and Messiah. And that's something that only Jesus can bring and reveal to us in our lives. The second point of application would be just that, that only Jesus can bring us this kind of sight necessary. Now, if we had more time, we could probably try to parse out a few more, I mean, more specific applications that might be more specific to living out life. Um, But I think for the time being, hopefully that shows you a bit of the process of what it might look like to work through a gospel passage and to try to see how those series of stories can fit together to explain to us, well, what's going on in this very strange-looking event of healing the blind man and Stages. Why did Jesus need to do that? Well, he didn't need to do it in stages, but he did it in stages to prove a point and to demonstrate a greater truth, not about physical healing, but about spiritual healing and spiritual sight. Okay, so with that in mind or with that done now, let's take a break for about five or six minutes and we'll come back and we'll start in um, part two of the lecture.